Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia. Welcome back to another episode of our Suzerain Let's Play. And we pick things back up with another meeting with the Assembly to lobby them. And we need 166 votes, or two-third majority, in our Assembly. Oh, this is very straightforward. Spend some money. Or spend a generous amount of money. Hmm. Let's go all in. This is our crown achievement for our term, and something that will consolidate our power moving forward. So I'm glad we got some investment money back from Enrica's investment, or else we would have been in a, a more limited capacity there. Chapter three, victim of changes. So we are progressing past chapter two and there are issues. Passing the law through the judiciary will be very difficult. And we are in a state of very badly uh, deficit here. Ah, Marcel wants to call us businessman. BFF recruitment, recruit militant to fight for BFF. The Gindamaris are military police. Okay. World ignores the Buddhist plight. Yes, this is very sad. I mean, from a pure objective perspective, the Buds are a people without a country, no nation state to defend their rights. But sadly, we are the president of Swordland. We, it's not our job. I mean, they live in our land, but, um, they want very different things. Belgish man shot after burning a Nolia flag. Ooh. Mm. Climbed the flagpole of the governor's office, burned it down, and then got shot in the neck and killed immediately. They're going to war, for sure. Land disputes don't end in words. Let's see what Marcel wants. The meeting was going to be about the ownership of the Big Four, the four largest corporations or com companies in Swordland. Heart of Swordland, Bergia Steel. This one is nationalized. Swordish state corporations also na- wait, actually, maybe these two. I actually forgot which two and which two are nationalized, two are private. Hmm, Walter owns a majority, so I'm guessing this one's private. Some of these companies were controlled in part or largely or entirely by the state. The others were mostly or completely privatized. I had the power to change that. The phone rang and I put the agenda down. Pick up the phone. Greetings, Mr. President. It has been a while, hasn't it? Let me try to remember. When's the last time we had a chat? Oh, I remember. It was in Conrate when you refused my generous offer. <laughs> uh, why did you? Why? Why did you call me? Or why are you calling me? Isn't that the best, better question, huh? I mean, I am starting to regret that. Uh, a very nice check plus underhaul would have probably got the job done, but um, let's not let him know that. Why did you call me? You probably know why I'm calling. It's because of the upcoming ownership meeting. But before we move on to that, I can't help but mention the tax breaks, Mr. President. They have been extraordinarily beneficial to our quarterly performance. HOS is now operating on a much larger revenue pool. You have successfully strengthened the backbone of the Swordish economy. Needless to say, I'm still expecting to reinvest any surplus back into the economy to create more jobs. Increasing our investment inside Swordland is a key topic in our board discussions. He paused for a few seconds. Out of goodwill, I will share a key piece of information. 
The Lothenburg group has contingency plans if you decide to do anything rash that would disrupt their empires. You can't blame them, can you? Imagine someone trying to take your authority and personal wealth away without your consent. I don't see why we should be enemies. Exactly. If everyone plays their card right, it will be all fine. Now, let's talk about those cards. Since the start of your campaign, you have wisely committed to a market economy. Judging by that, I'm sure you are looking into privatizing some of the companies that are currently state-owned. I believe, therefore, privatizing both Nedim Mining Group, Eastern Macopa, Lorenburgia Limited Operation, Gold Mining, Coal, Diamonds, Okay, and the sort of state corporation would be in both of our interests. After all, I'm considered buying stocks in both companies. I'm not thinking about privatization. What do you mean? You will leave everything the same then. Don't tell me you're thinking about nationalizing. I'm thinking about a balanced approach. Balance is important, Mr. President, but the concept of nationalization goes against everything my father built and stood for. Think of your corporate allies as a sea of ravenous sharks surrounding you. We could coexist peacefully or... Ah, uh, let's not imagine that scenario. We don't need to be enemies. No, we don't, as long as we both understood what entails not being enemies. I always keep my end of the bargain, Mr. President, don't forget. You had better keep yours as well. He cleared his throat. Before we end the call, there is actually one more thing I would like to discuss. I'll be blunt. Mr. Tuss is unfit to be the spokesperson for the Lothberg Group. His archaic thinking has only preserved a status quo that benefits himself and a precious few others. It is time something changed. Huh. Stop. Before you say any more, I won't meddle in oligarchy affairs. Ah, it was worth a shot, but I respect your decision. Very well, I won't push farther. I've taken up enough of your time today. This had been a productive call. Thank you for your time, Mr. President. Thanks, Marcel. I'll talk to you later. Alright, I don't like the man. Not that I prefer Tusk, but I don't want to get messed up in their little intrigue. We want them as allies, doesn't matter who is their speakesperson or spokesperson. Refugees suffer because of rain. Indeed, that is true. Some head to Lesbia, where they are accepted, but must undergo the country's labyrinth of Salem pro uh, pro process. No, this is not our... I mean, why, why, why are they... I mean, it's the radicals, but why are they complaining about other country citizens here? Right. Increased number of arrests for illegal crossing, and we are deporting them. Earlier this week, the general staff held a meeting in which Isof Lancia voiced his pleasure to work under the administration. According to rumors, the current president is a man of tradition. He is strong. He is decisive. I'd worked with President Seoul before. I know President Seoul. He is my friend. I know that he is proud of what President Anton has achieved. Right, we got the military under our wings, which was kind of our goal after the election. Ah, Lucian wants the meeting. Upcoming economy meeting. He arrived on time as usual and took his seat right across from me. Good morning, Mr. President. Lucian had dark circles below his eyes. The plethora of political developments must have been weighing even on a workaholic like him. You look a bit tired. Are you getting enough sleep? I'm trying to, sir. 
Don't push yourself too much. I'll try not to. I must say, you don't look much better. I looked myself in a small hand mirror, similar circle beneath my eyes as well. I booked some of your time to pre-plan for today's meeting at the Ministry of Economy. We need to be cautious. Any grand plans about the economy also heavy, heavily influence our political standing. We would be changing our relationship with the old guard, the oligarchy, and the opposition. As you know, this meeting will give you the opportunity to alter the ownership of the Big Four, the largest corporations in all of Sortland. We can start the process of nationalization or privatization, or we can just keep the status quo. Again, I remind you that any change will tip an already fragile balance. I personally think we should stay out of this and keep things as they are. There is no need to make new political enemies at this stage in our term, but ultimately the decisions the decision is yours. What are you leaning towards, and how should we move forward? We will maintain the status quo. Excellent. This is the safest way to victory. Yeah, we have too much on our hand to really do this. Lucian took a note in his notebook. Although I think the oligarchies would have liked us to privatize everything, maintain the status quo will not disturb our relationship with them. This means more stability, both economically and politically. Speaking of stability, some of my connection indicate there seems to be a contest, a contest for leadership in Lothenburg Group. It looks like Marcel Quarantini is making a move to become the key figure. Quarantini、uh, Quar probably wants his father's seat as the head of the group, and Tus doesn't want to let it go. It's a significant power struggle considering these are the heads of Sortland's two largest private corporations. Another reason why I'm supporting your decision to leave the situation as it is. There's no reason for us to interfere directly or indirectly in their eternal struggles. Did Marcel or Tus contact you? I received a call from Marcel. What did he ask for? I stopped him before he could say anything. Not involving ourselves in the oligarchy's business will save us from potential headaches. At any rate, this internal conflict among the oligarchies put us in an interesting position. Our relationship with Walter Tux has been very strong so far, and we had the backing of our he thanks to that. Lucian looked at his watch. Well, very well then. I'll cancel the meeting since we're not taking any actions. I must get back to work. I'm glad you made this decision. Thank you for your time, sir. Lucian got up from his chair and left the office. Yes, we have too much on our plate, and we just can't chew the business side of things. Aside from trying to keep things stable and make some money back. Tension rises in the sea. Naval conflict continues. Right, we have Vaugsland naval active in Marken Sea. We did improve our navy, just in case this thing blows up. We need to protect our trade routes. Ah, we have the Unified Education Language Act. <laughs> And this is definitely something we will pass. This is the promise we gave to Kibner for his full support in the vote, forcing all schools to teach Swedish. Not really a big ask, in my opinion. Ooh. Livia intercepted me in front of my office and informed me that I had a call from Walter Tusk. I entered and picked up the phone. Mr. Tusk, to what do I owe the pleasure? Good afternoon, President. I heard some disturbing news. That damn boy, Marcel Quarantini. I found some evidence linking him to Coronelli Cartel, powerful crime syndicate. Why am I not surprised? Frankly, I was not surprised either. But what I, what I want is simple. I'll give all the information I have to the officials. I want you to start an investigation to Heart of Swordland. That's all I ask. That's not too much to ask, is it? You'll bring a known criminal to justice. <laughs> I'll decide after I see the evidence. Fair enough. Heed my words, President. He is a dangerous man. I have to attend to my business now. Have a good afternoon and think about what I said. The line dropped dead. We didn't commit, but I personally do not like Marcel. Please launch successful raid. 
Mm, confiscating illegal firearms and drugs. Crime family. Cornelli. Started in bootlegging. We just know their headquarter, illegal drug and organ trafficking. Okay. Operations possible because we have a stronger law enforcement budget. Good to know. Seems like we only have the main issues here. We are still below 25%. <laughs> Not very popular. It's time for the vote. The road to the National Grand National Assembly. I fully expect we pass this. We have done everything in our power to appease all sides. Sergei was driving me toward the Grand National Assembly for today's hi historical vote. It was a big day. I wonder whether my attempt at changing the constitution would end any differently than Alfonso's. I looked out the window as the noise of the city diminished and saw that we were already inside the palace complex. The complex housed buildings of all government branches in the center of Hosord. It was one of the biggest development in Sortland. The Maroon Palace stood on a small hilltop surrounded by trees. We passed by the palace and entered the forest that separated it from the Grand National Assembly. We drove on a small road that wound through the forest. It was a warm day, so I rolled down the window. I could hear birds singing from the trees. Are you okay back there, sir? Hey, Sergey. I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm as good as I can be, sir. Sergey made a left turn out of the forest and entered the vast garden area of the assembly. Did you know that Mr. Tarquinso came to so uh, Hoso this morning? I heard some politician talking about it today. Apparently this is the first time he come to the city in the last five years. I thought he left the mainland and lived on Doro Island, never to return back to politic. But they were saying he might be here to exercise his member of honor rights for the first time and vote in the assembly. Wait, what? Who was talking about this? I overheard several men talking about it around the gardens of the assembly, so I'm not sure who they were. It could just be rumors, of course. Do you think he's here about today's vote? Yes, Sergei, most likely. Well, I'm sure he will support you, sir. We'll learn soon enough. This is a complication, for sure. We did take away a lot of his nationalistic programs in education, and uh, we are change we, we didn't change his membership, right? Imagine if we had stripped away the member of honor, and he comes here for that vote. That would make a scene with the old guards like Gloria in our party. Sergey drove inside the gates of the parkway and parked the car. We have arrived, sir. Thank you, Sergey. Of course, sir. Good luck with the vote. I walked up the white stone stairs of the Grand National Assembly. The entrance looked like a temple gate from the classical era. The door opened to reveal vast corridors of wood and white stone. I joined the crowd of people who were walking slowly towards the parliamentary hall. Suddenly, I noticed Lucian emerge from the crowd of packed politicians in front of me. He looked relieved when he saw me. Ah, sir, there you are. Have you seen Vice President Vector? He's nowhere to be found. I just arrived here, Lucian. I hope Mr. Vector arrives soon, too. At any rate, how about yourself? Are you ready to finally face the assembly, sir? Lucian, I just heard something worrying from Sergei. We'll address that later, sir. Come, we must go inside. We followed the crowd into the parliamentary hall. After we were inside, Lucian and I separated to take our assigned seats. I went up to the mezzanine, overlooking the hall, and sat down. I waited as the MPs took their place inside the hall one by one. After a while, I saw Gloria walk to her elevated seat at the center of the hall. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. We'll begin shortly. We'll, we'll shortly begin with today's agenda of the USP proposed changes to the Constitution of Swordland. After a short while, everyone was in their seats. 
According to the current constitution, constitutional amendments require a two-third majority in order to reach assembly approval. If the vote succeeds, the proposal will be sent to the Supreme Court. The proposal in question includes these points. She started reading the proposal to the assembly. First section of the changes, Article 57 is modified with the following. She continued reading the proposal, highlighting each section. Section 2, paragraph 36, she went on, may not exercise his right to and on the justices of the Supreme Court. Most of the MPs seem like they're already falling asleep. A simple majority is considered. The seats were really hurting my back. Section 4, paragraph 44a. It felt like eternity had passed. Finally, she finished reading the changes. I hereby invite all of you to vote. She struck her gavel down. The loud bang made some MPs jump up in shock as they woke from their deep sleep. As I previously stated, it would require a two-third majority in order to pass. You may now cast your votes. I felt the need to stand up and stretch. I looked down at the hall from the platform I was seated on. Some assembly members immediately walked to the ballot box to cast their votes. Most of them, however, began to congregate in groups around the hall, discussing the changes. Let's remain calm, sit back down and keep watching. I saw some people cast their votes, but many were still walking around the hall or talking to each other. Then I noticed Cassaro Kibner approaching. He stopped below the mezzanine and looked up at me. Go down and talk to him. Mr. President, how are you feeling about the vote? I'm hoping for the best. Don't worry, we'll get through this. I'll go vote now. See you afterwards. He abruptly turned away from me and walked towards his seat. Then I saw Lucian waving at me. He was among the people in the corner of the hall. I walked up to him. On my way, I bumped into Manson Leakey, the leader of the Independent. They own 10 seats in our parliament. Buddhist descent. Obviously not going to love our policies. Mr. President, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. He gave me a cold stare. Excuse me. He straightened his tie and walked away. I finally reached Lucian by now deep in conversation with another member of our party. He excused himself and turned towards me. Sir, did you vote yet? We have to be quick. What's the rush? I'll explain on the way. I signed my vote and prepared the envelope. Together, Lucian and I walked to the center of the hall to cast our votes. He kept rushing me throughout the process. Gloria bowed her head slightly in respect as she saw us vote. Lucian pulled up my arm and whispered in my ear. Mr. President, we may have a problem. Tarquin Soul is here. I know. You have to accelerate the voting process. We need everyone to vote as soon as possible. We don't know what he's capable of right now, but if the assembly members see him, he might influence them against the proposal. Should I talk to him? I would advise against that right now. The assembly must focus on the vote. Any confrontation between the two of you would draw their attention away. Go and ask Gloria to speed up the voting. She banged the gavel several times, the sound echoed across the room. Ladies and gentlemen of the assembly, we'll soon begin counting. Please cast your vote if you haven't already. The pace in the hall definitely increased. The groups disperse and MPs begin lining up to the, at the ballot box. Suddenly Lucian pulled me aside. Sir, what do we do? He pointed at the back of the assembly near one of the exits. I followed his fingers to see Tarquin Sol sitting there. He looked much older than he had five years ago, but I could tell he had some fire in him. Some MPs already gathered around him and were chattering at all. The assembly gradually went quiet as people started to notice Sol's presence in the hall. I'll go talk to him. We should refrain from giving him the spotlight he expects. Maybe you can address him after the vote. As I was talking to Lucian, I spotted Cassaro Kipner walking to the back of the hall towards Tarquin Sol. He bowed in front of Sol and gave him a military salute. Seeing this, more people started to approach him. Suddenly Gloria come, came up behind us. Gentlemen, why don't you go back to your seat? Let's follow the procedures. Oh, by the way, we have 251 members today. As you can see, the Member of Honor is here. He has already cast his vote. Has he now? So, Mrs. Torrey, how many votes are missing? Only a few. 
Albin Calvin and three other men approach us with envelopes in their hand, and these must be them. Good day to you, gentlemen, Madam Speaker. Good day, Mr. Clavin. I'm sorry to take so long, Mr. President. There was a friend who needed more clarification for his vote. He gestured at a man behind him. Let's just let's get this over with, gentlemen. They went ahead and casted their vote. So he's probably strong arming his own wing of the party to vote for me, or I hope, because I promised him vice president, which I do intend to make happen because. Peter is a disappointment so far. Let's win this, Mr. President. And I also question why we can vote. As president, are we also a member of the assembly? That seems very weird.、Uh, Lucian as well as our chief strategist. Why does he get a vote? Now, why don't you two get back to your seats as well? Very well, we shall. Although, now that I think about it. Maybe we ran as part of the assembly, and then the ruling party within the assembly picks the leader of their party to be president. Sort of like,、um, I mean, parliamentary system. So we're both a member of both, and Lucian. And then we pick ministers and cabinets from the assembly as well, which is why. Anyways, we voted. I saw Peter sitting in the chair next to mine. Peter, how are you doing? The usual. He looked at Gloria as she and her assistant counted the votes. The speaker's seat was only a few meters away from our platform. I really hope this proposal goes through. Sol is here. What? He's at the back of the hall. Fuck. He tried to get Gloria's attention by waving at her. How many votes left? Gloria looked at Peter. She looked annoyed. It's looking pretty good. Twenty more votes to count. Peter turned to me. Thank God. <laughs> That's great. Peter pointed at where Casaro Kibner was sitting. Looks like Casaro over there is in our corner. Yes, he's an important ally. Well, a single bang from Gloria's gravel, a gavel. Reverberated across the hall. Everyone felt silent. The voting has been concluded. I lean forward to hear the results. The proposal has 179 ayes and 72 nays. Thereby, the Grand National Assembly has surpassed a two-third majority and accepted the changes to the Constitution. This is a very high number. We have 130 in our party, and there's 40 votes. By them, so that means we got support from nine votes that we did not expect. That includes the seventy votes that's owned by the People's、uh, Freedom and Justice Party, as well as the ten votes from the Independent, plus the one extra vote from Tarquin Soul. So nine of those people voted for us. So I'm thinking Tarquin came here to vote yes. The proposal will be presented to the Supreme Court shortly for the final voting procedure. The assembly roared with all kinds of different reactions. Yes, we did it. Not so fast. We still have the court to pass. Suddenly, I noticed Tarquin so slowly rising from his seat at the back. He seemed to be struggling and used his cane for help. He stood and gazed around the hall as all members of the Grand National Assembly went silent. Call out to him. Huh. Let's give him the 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 grand introduction. The faithful and selfless servant of our nation, the distinguished face of our republic, Colonel Tarquin Soule. He looked at me. I mean, he's the the leader of the coup that um. Solved the civil war. Well, he's not the coup. The coup happened, then the civil war happened, and then he solved the civil war and built the government. He looked at me. Congratulations, Mr. Rain. He turned his back and walked out the exit as two of his guards held the door for him. Thank God he didn't do anything. He's very composed. He didn't. He's not here for the spotlight. In any case, the proposal has passed the assembly, but now we have to think about the Supreme Court. 
also Hawker will be a problem. Our best bet is to divide the old guard vote is Gorasi. He's the most corrupt person I've ever known. After I talked with Peter about the vote, we both left the hall to discuss our next step. Corruption, huh? It'd be nice if we had some wealth. We waited for Sergei by the entrance. Constitutional changes passed by the assembly. Next week on Friday. We don't have much time. Kibner congratulate the president. New constitution passes. In spite heavy opposition and special appearance. Yeah, it's symbolic. I mean, assuming he voted for us against the constitution that he wrote. Okay, I guess it's all business from here. Peter, Lucian, and I convened on a massive balcony of the palace. It was nice to catch a breeze in the increasing summer heat. Both had grins on their faces, but Peter got larger as he kept recounting our success in the assembly. Fellas, the first obstacle has been cleared. Congratulations to all of us. We can celebrate once we get past the court. The president's right. The assembly was the easy part. Peter leaned on the balcony railing. What about Tarquin's soul? Did you see him again? As far as I know, he's still staying in Holson, but hasn't cared to pay his respect to President Rain yet. What the hell was all that about? He him appearing him out appearing out of nowhere. What do you think was his real intention? He wished to intimidate the assembly into rejecting our proposal, sir, and it seems to have failed, but we can't be sure. He might be here to work with the court. So Lucian still thinks he's against us, and that might be true. I mean, we are voting down his assembly, his constitution, but we didn't take away many of the important things for him. As long as he's around, he will always have influence over the republic he built. We should have seen this coming. But he has no authorities anymore. Well, the law protects him from almost anything and allow him to be a member of the assembly. He can still produce bills and vote for them. That's proper authority, if you ask me. When you are the founder of the system, you don't need to be sitting in the presidential office to have power. I want to talk to him. Are you sure he's still in Holosoid? That's what my sources say, sir. But considering he hasn't come to the palace, I don't know what to expect. It smells fishy. Just try to reach out to him. I'll do my best, sir. Let's now move to our next steps. Yeah, we have the first hurdle cleared, but now we have the council of grumpy old men in our way. I have to say, that's a fitting description of the court. But unfortunately for us, they're more than that. They are our largest obstacle yet. Also, You've forgotten about Mrs. Edmonds. They're not all grumpy old man. And also, Nia. Nia is also part of the court. Right, there we go. And Mrs. Morgna. She's technically a member too. Wait, did you just call Nia a grumpy old woman? He laughed. Lucian took a look at him with a raised eyebrow. Anyway, he cleared his throat. About the court, Mrs. Morgna has been reluctant to help with the lobbying of the court, but she has accepted to at least try and convince the justices to organize a meeting with us, which means our lobbying effort has not yet bore fruit. It will be up to you and Miss Morgna, sir. And Nia was pretty adamant about her position against the proposal. That's already one vote lost out of eleven. So she's serious about voting against the proposal. I'm afraid she is. I knew she would be a headache. Not to make it sound more depressing, but it's not only about her. Let's not forget about Mr. Hawker and his loyalist. That's four or five votes gone, right from the start. Yes, we'll need to reach out to the old guards and the moderates in order to reach six votes. There is not much leeway.
If the reformist justices are against us, along with the old guards, how do we even get six votes? It's a tough spot to be in, as I said. We have no other way but to convince Mr. Hawker's fellow old guard members behind his back. We may need to take some extreme measures, though. Hey, we won the vote comfortably. I'm sure that counts for something. There's at least some pressure on the court now. The court still sees us as a threat. They will not be persuaded so easily. Hmm. Well, we never expected this to be easy. Nothing has changed. That's true, sir. In any case, we should start with our best bet. I already asked Nia to arrange a meeting with Mrs. Edmonds. She is a reformist, I believe. Okay. But, wait. This is a, a bit mixed. She's willing to speak with you. How about Heron? He refused to speak with us. He refused to speak with you, Peter. But if the president can have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him, I'm sure he will open up. Lucian suddenly turned around and pointed at the side entrance to the balcony. Look who's coming. It was Casaro Kibner. He walked up, he was slowly walking up to us with a smile on his face and spread his arms wide as he approached us. Here you are, the most dangerous men in the Maroon Palace. Good after afternoon, Mr. Kibner. Welcome, Mr. Kibner. How are you doing? I'm good, Mr. President. You must be feeling similarly. Our cooperation yielded spectacular results. Casaro squinted into the bright sunlight. God damn, this sun. He reached down to his pocket, pulled out a pair of sunglasses, and set them on his nose. Did you three figure out the, the core situation? Most of them have been resisting our efforts, but we're working on it. It's not looking good? To be honest, it's not. I see. Well, I hope you do something about it. It's not like the justices are big fans of this administration. Anyways, I'll leave you three to whatever you were conspiring to before I came. The heat here is killing me. We should catch up soon. He walked back to the door and left the balcony. Look at him go, that man. I don't trust him. He wants to take credit for the new constitution. If it passes, that is. I respect the man, but he's overestimating himself. He's just playing the hero, sir. The honorable sword against all odds. Lucian looked at his watch. I think it's time to conclude our little meeting, sir. There's a tap on my shoulder. Olivia Suno has joined us on the balcony. Pardon the interruption, gentlemen. Mr. President, David Vinci is on is calling about the upcoming foreign policy meeting. Perfect timing. Tell him I'll be right there. I will, sir. She turned to leave the balcony, then back to us. Congratulations on the victory, Mr. Rain. Peter? He looked Peter in the eye as she says this, ignoring Lucian altogether. Peter's eye followed her as she walked out. Getting pretty hot out there, out here. Okay, let's call a finish. You may both go. Alright, gentlemen, see you later. They both left. Huh, that was a little interesting uh, relationship between uh, Peter and our secretary, potentially. There was a couple dialogue options for us to flirt with her, but uh, we declined those. A nice movie premiere. Kipner congratulated, okay. Ooh. A whistleblower from Rumberg Security Bureau has escaped to Swordland by crossing the water and turning him to authority in Estord. Agent Charleston Hailstone was promised to review extremely sensitive information about development of a weapon program. We can Give him, give refuge to him, and risk antagonizing Rumberg, or send him back. This is a um, very tense situation. I don't think sending him back will make us any friends. We shall grant asylum. This might have repercussions. 
Alright, he's been transferred to a safe house in Antel. Perimeter is guarded by special force units. Interrogating him. Make sure he's not a double agent. Why are you putting this in the news? This is stuff that we should be hush hush about. And then we go to a movie. I've been invited to an exclusive preview of Alfred Hickberg. Hitchcock, right? That's what they're going for. Um, most influential. With the Buddhist cast, Resident Carl, Citizen Kane. Is that what the reference is? Banned by Seoul. International importance. Sort of dream. The morning shall come. Although I wasn't much of a moviegoer going mood, it would have been unpresidential not to attend. With its massive budget and Kerbrook's directorial cachet, this drama was set to be a milestone for Swartland's burgeoning film scene. Personally, though, I was just looking forward to spending some time with my family. It's a very hot and sunny day as Sergei drove us to the old capital. The film was being screened in the historical cinema Angli de Avery, the, first, the very first cinema in Swordland. A gaze of the vast plains between Hosword and Avery Erlery. As we drove on the H1, Sergei was maxed out, had maxed out the air conditioning to keep the Cadillac comfortable. Frank fidgeted with his tie as he stared out the window. What's wrong, Frank? Since when do you care about what's happening in my life? I've been busy lately, but I always have time for you. What an honor, your highness. Frank, don't talk to your father that way. He's been working so hard for this country. All right, let's talk to our lovely daughter. Excited for the movie? Deanna nod happily. What about you, Papa? You won something, right? You should smile and keep doing your best, even if you lose. That's my girl. Thanks a lot. You've been awfully quiet, Monica. I just want to focus on having a nice time at the movies. Monica folded her arms. We drove on in silence. Sergey rolled down the soundproof glass between us. Sir, we're about to enter Erlery. We'll be at the cinema in a few minutes. Thank you, Sergey. I took a brief look outside as Sergey rolled the soundproof glass up again. I could see many towers of Erlery rising over what's left of the old city walls. Sergey knocked on the glass and gestured forward. We're at the main square of Erlery. The historical cinema in Glee, the cinema of angels, was right in front of us. Is this the place? Yeah. It was an old Baruch-style corner building with walls that look marble from a distance. They wore exquisite ornaments on each side of every window. Sergei pulled the car to the entrance of the building, which was lit by vivid neon strips of many colors. On the wall next to the entrance, there was a painted word, Stop the oppression of boots. Come on, let's get out. Sergei opened the doors and we exit onto the red carpet. We are just about to enter the building when journalists Lock the path, reporter. Mr. President, Mr. President, your constitutional reform made it through the assembly. How do you feel about their chances with the Supreme Court? I trust the justices will make the right decision. Thank you, Mr. President. And were you aware that Tarquin Soul will be present at the proceedings? Uh... I refuse to discuss Colonel Soul at this time. Before you go ask anything else, the guards usher us into the theater. In contrast with the similar Baroque style exterior, the interior was modern and sleek, with bare walls painted in black, red, and white. The film's cast and crew are ready in the foyer, with glasses of champagne in their hands. We approached the crowd and were welcomed by the producers and even event organizers. A man walked, us, walked, walked up to us with quick steps. Madam, Mr. President, it's so good to see you here. He gently bowed to Monica and shook our hands. It's an honor to meet you. I'm Alfred Kerbuck. 
The honor is mine, Mr. Kerberg. I'm a big fan of your work. Frank snorted. I glanced at him. He innocently took a sip of his cola. Alfred Kerberg, it's very humbling to know that you've been watching and enjoying my movies. If you don't mind me asking, which one was your favorite? This one might be slightly different from my previous work. All right, time to look at Dossier. Rebecca, Touch of Satan, Eye Wide Open, Sword of Stream. Let's go with Sword of Stream. Yes, the Sword of Stream. Oh, really? Then you might enjoy this one too. I'll admit, I didn't expect you to be such a cinephile. Frank looked me in the eye and struggled not to laugh. Why don't we take our seats? It's about to start. We entered the screening room, the light dimmed, and the film begun. It was a period drama set in the 1870s about a sort of soldier who pursued a doomed romance with the widowed brutish farmer during the conquest of Bergia. I wondered briefly whether Kerbrook was commenting on my own treatment of the British people, but then he had finished filming long before I became president. As the credit rolled, I made an early exit to see the men's room. I was washing my hand when I heard an unmistakable voice behind me. So, what did you think? Harkwinsel leaned on his cane. He had the same frail appearance I noticed at the assembly meeting, yet up close I could still sense the raw magnetism that had kept him in power for nearly for 20 years. <laughs> I found the plot questionable, but it certainly looks spectacular. What about yourself? Sentimental problem for the enjoyment of housewives only. And for a period piece, the script contained far too many anachronisms. Oh, historian. Uh, totes. I'm surprised to see you still around, sir. What were you doing at the assembly? My country was about to make a rash decision. I couldn't simply stand by or sit by. I still have immense respect for you, Colonel. I wish it was reciprocated. It will be when you prove yourself worthy of it. Why do you want these reforms blocked so badly? I will not let an upstart like you tarnish my party and my constitution. I'm doing this for the good of the country. Ha! Some of his spittle landed on my cheek. You'll find out soon enough how your country repays you for your goodness. He slipped past me out the door. Social security staff and mine were now clustered outside the washroom, forming a buffer against the larger crowd that had gathered. That's Tarquin Soul, I heard someone scream. His guard closed around him and my around, my, uh, around me. By the time the chaos subsided, I was back in the car with my family, and so was long gone. Eventful, so he is here against us. Ray and Soul meet at Kerbrook's screening. New law on education and Swordish language. Right, that has been passed. Peaceful protest. Passed budget, bill and reform. Not as bad since they remain peaceful. Now, one film, two special guests, washroom summit, rain signs, racist bill. To allow our own language to be taught in school is racist now. Bill sign, yeah, language protest, right, Buddhist population over here. Drop school in protests, okay. Day of Dissension, it's a big religious holiday. Dinner with family, briefing on diplomatic strategies. Okay, so I think we have time for a nice dinner after that movie. And walk, arrive home from work, haul my jacket up, and put my briefcase in the hall. I paused, wait, awaiting my usual greeting from my wife and daughter. Diana was out at one of her after school art classes, I remembered, but where was Monica? From the living room, I heard a muffled sob. I entered to find Monica sitting on the sofa, a letter in her hands, and a look of despair on her face. Darling, what's wrong? 
Monica briefly rested her head on my shoulders and then handed me the letter. It's from the Department of Education. Frank's university exam results are in. How did he do? See for yourself. I looked at the page. Below Frank's name and address, his score is written. 435 points out of a total of a thousand. At the bottom of the letter, the word failed was stamped in red. All those years of effort, all those private lessons, all down the drain. You know what this means, he's gonna have to join the military. He could die, Anton. Does he know the results yet? No, but he should be back from school soon. I just don't understand, Frank's a smart boy. Why would he sabotage himself like this? I heard a key turning in the front door. Frank stomped in and was about to go straight upstairs when he noticed us both in the living room. Mom? Dad? What's going on? Have a seat, Frank. He took a seat across from us. I handed him the letter. He started reading it. Oh shit. Son, we're not angry at you. I, I need a moment. He went to the kitchen sink and washed his face. A moment later, he came back. I never thought this would happen. I'm so sorry. It's not the end of the world. Pretty close though, isn't it? Frank looked close to tears. Monica put her hand on his shoulder. It's gonna be okay. But you really should have studied harder, Frank. I know. I guess it's the army for me then. <laughs> Pull some strings for our son? <sighs> so it seems. Anton, isn't there anything you can do? If Alfonso could get his dimwit son into Kings Hill University, I'm sure Hoso State would have room for a bright boy like Frank. <sighs> I do have connections to the board. Hoso State would be amazing. A bunch of my friends are going there. I could still come home to do my laundry. Wait, you could also study abroad. Ah, uh, that's the only option? Send him to United Cantana is gonna raise some eyebrows. We could just have him go to the military. He could very well die. My wife could be very, very sad. Us too. He is our son. <sighs> we'll offer it. Communism, I can dig that. Not exactly how I was expecting to spend my student years, but anything's better than the military. This is the future of our boy, Anton. What should we do? Sending him to the state university just feels like he's not going to grow up, but as parents, do you really want your kid to ever grow up? Monica will be happy. I'm, I'm leaning towards these two. This one might cost us. Alright, we'll put him into state college. Thanks so much, Dad. I swear I won't let you down this time. Monica let out a long exhale. What a day. Who's hungry for dinner? Monica disappeared to the kitchen, Frank to his room. I went to my office and began making some phone calls. Right, we have to bribe a school. 
with no wealth. No wealth. Anyhow, um, I think that's a good uh, concluding point as we are forced to uh, resort to a, a bit of corruption to uh, get our son into a college. Anyways, we'll come back and face that when that time comes, and I hope these can hurry up so we can finally get some economy going. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Bye!